ANSI practices in the areas of toxic tort and personal injury defense. Her experience includes representing the manufacturers of three and four wheelers, motorcycles, personal watercraft, light truck wheels, airless spray guns, pesticides, and golf course trenching equipment, as well as representing various trucking and rental car companies, a very female roster of products. Enjoying the low humidity of August in New York, please welcome from New Orleans, Nancy Marshall. Well, I do do products liability, but I also defend lawyers. And uh, I think we've all probably had the experience of somehow being connected to really crazy cases that are, have no basis, where for some reason the plaintiffs have gone after the lawyers who handle the underlying case. And that's what I want to talk about. Um, there's more. Uh, there are these cases where some simple negligence case or products liability case is turned into a fraud or uh, a security fraud case or a RICO action uh, after the case is over. And one in particular that I handled early on uh, was a lawyer who had defended an alleged injury uh, at the Haynes Best Western in Alexandria, uh, Louisiana. I just want to say that one thing about these are the allegations of such lawsuits are really emotionally draining and financially draining on the lawyers. This particular lawsuit was terrifying. Um, in the underlying case, Mrs. Williamson claimed she had been electrocuted at the Haynes Best Western when she reached up uh, in her motel room and found that there was water coming out of the ceiling through a lamp uh, hanging lamp, and uh, there are different versions of this. In some versions, the um, light bulb was cracked, and she decided to remove the bulb while the water was pouring out of it. Um, and there are very many, many different uh, stories that she gave about this. Um, she left. Uh, her husband claimed that he came in and found her lying blue on the floor, and so he promptly went and did what any husband would do, which is go to the front desk and uh, proceed to say, "I have, I have a claim against the, uh, the hotel." <laughs> It was different, I'm telling you. Um, and the other thing that was weird about this case and this, this whole accident, in quotes, was that the Williamson's uh, had a house in Alexandria, in Louisiana, but for whatever reason, they chose to live in the lovely Best Western for a month, and that they changed rooms frequently, and, uh, and finally settled on this one room, room 170, I still know the number of it, uh, and this is where this accident happened. Um, there was no source for the water dripping down, and this was the only room in the hotel that for whatever reason had a crawl space above the room. Um, the accident wasn't witnessed by anyone. As I said, Mr. Williamson came in. Um, he continually refused treatment uh, for his wife for this alleged electrocution. Weirdly, she was seen just a few days after the accident at a beauty pageant in Alexandria. Um, and, but nonetheless, she gradually, her condition deteriorated, she became incontinent, she became wheelchair bound. Uh, the examination of the ER doctor, who I believe she was taken to a couple days later, found no marks or burns on her skin consistent with electricity. Her tests were all normal. Uh, and as I said, she nonetheless became wheelchair bound, incoherent, sometimes incontinent, but it's hard to check that. Um, <laughs> Later tests and examinations were hindered by her refusing to submit to testing by screaming. Um, ultimately, way down the line, when we did an independent medical examination of her, they, we had a very interesting IME doctor who showed, and he tested her urine, and it showed significant amounts of uh, diphenhydramine in her blood system. That is basically cough syrup. And it can really, if you drink enough of it, affect you and make you look very weird. Uh, and she did look weird. Um, so meanwhile, back to the underlying case, a defense verdict had been rendered in the underlying case. And the defense attorney, a very fine defense attorney, had done this bang up job. The Williamsons were career claims people. And by that I mean they didn't you know, do what you guys do. Uh, they made claims. And so they had already had about 35 claims at that point. They kind of found, ran a family business. Um, Mr. Williamson's mother was involved in it and they would rent cars um, with, and take out a lot of insurance on it and then have accidents and claim to be brain damaged. It's amazing how many times you can be brain damaged. Um, and, so the, and so one of the, the, the techniques of the defense attorney was to say, this is a family enterprise, OK? Uh, and this was presented to the jury. And, the, and they also presented to the jury that she was 
this was, uh, the accident was fraudulently created, created. Well, the jury found that she had been injured, um, but it was a fraudulent accident. Interesting, kind of like she got injured, you know, because she did present very well as an injured person, especially when she was drugged. Um, so then uh, where I came into the thing was after they had won this and it was on appeal, uh, the Williams brought a RICO action against the defendants, the original defense lawyer and his clients, based on alleged theory of the hiding of the evidence. Now, what had happened here is uh, there, of course, had been an inspection at the Haynes Best Western, and uh, for reasons that were never quite clear to me, the plaintiff had one expert look at it and then a second one, and my lawyer had one expert look at it and then a second one too when this other person came around. And, uh, and at, at the time, the, uh, his, his expert, his non-testifying expert, as it turned out, uh, found that um, there was some stray voltage at the wall switch, you know, like this would be the hanging lamp and the wall switch is over there. Uh, but it was no, made no difference, okay? Um, and so uh, my attorney didn't think anything about it. Well, after he won the lawsuit, this consultant expert became a consultant for the plaintiff attorney for the Williamsons. And he, somehow the subject came up about this trial and they found out he had been a consultant expert and apparently he told them that the stray voltage could have injured Mrs. Williamson. So this RICO claim was brought that we had hidden, we, my lawyer identified with them, had hidden evidence uh, and, uh, and a, an incredible argument and allegations were made, RICO allegations, nine separate state, count, uh, state, uh, state uh, claims, state law claims. Um, gotten ahead of myself here. Uh, the plans also sought to actually nullify that a, a motion or uh, petition to nullify the original judgment. So we're really fighting this case on two different fronts, the RICO action in federal court and a nullification action in state court, and the appeal of the original, three funds, of the original uh, jury verdict. Thankfully, while this was going on, a very thoughtful judge on the Court of Appeal wrote a brilliant, wonderful decision about the facts of the Williamson's and sort of laid out their history, which was extremely helpful. Um, so then the Williams filed a counterclaim against St. Paul, the insurance company, and its lawyers, including mine. Um, and uh, the claim said basically that the defenses that they had brought were fraudulent claims. Um, and as I said, the Williamson's asserted RICO violations against the defendant lawyer, the other defendants as aiders and abettors. Um, and th then they also had separate state law claims, as well as conspiracy, of course. Why not? So. Um, at, and the issue in the, in the RICO lawsuit was whether the opinions of Mr. George Caselis, the non-testifying electrical engineer, retained by the defense, uh, were discoverable. Well, we were all elated because the federal magistrate ruled that the non-testifying experts' report and findings were not discoverable. But the digit, and so this was appealed, of course, by the plaintiffs, and they made really pretty scurrilous allegations in their brief uh, appealing the magistrate's ruling. Um, and the district court, after reading this very incendiary uh, brief, called all counsel. I'll never forget this. I was uh, sitting in my office, and uh, we were told they were going to expect a, a call from the federal judge. And he required that every defense counsel who had ever signed a pleading in this case be present at a conference when there was going to be a hearing on this appeal uh, of the, uh, from the magistrate's ruling that the non-testifying experts' opinions weren't um, weren't uh, to be discovered. And he also shortened defense counsel's time to appeal. Uh, he also said that if the allegations of the petition were true, there would be lots of lawyers who could be in jail. Now this was disturbing, needless to say. Um, and uh, so much so that uh, everybody who had ever touched a piece of paper in this with my office was at the federal courthouse with me. I had to leave a dying relative's deathbed, literally. Um, and um, and the other thing that had happened in the interim of this was, was really fascinating was uh, my lawyer client called me and said, uh, I'm really freaking out. Uh, you know, we were cleaning house and we found this box, uh, and in this, which must have been sent to us by the non-testifying experts some six years befo before, and it was stuck away somewhere, and in it was a light switch. So that would be a huge issue, you know, in terms of spoliating evidence and so on and so forth. So we had sort of a conclave of all the lawyers involved for all the parties in this to decide what to do with this. 
And we finally, because you know, you don't want to bring it forward because you're saying that what the non-testifying expert did is privileged, so you would be breaching the privilege if you did that. So what do you do with this thing? Well, we finally sent it sealed to the judge with a long letter explaining the circumstances and saying, we don't want to withhold evidence. On the other hand, we don't want to breach the confidentiality you know, that you have with a non-testifying expert. And uh, that turned out to be the right thing to have done. Uh, apparently, and this is still amazing to me, the judge met with the electrical engineer who was the non-testifying expert, had a private conversation with him. I don't even understand it yet. Uh, and uh, when we got there on that particular Friday, um, he ruled uh, that, um, that the, 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 uh, what the non-testifying expert had done was privileged. No one was entitled to know what, what the non-testifying expert had said to him. He never mentioned the box. Uh, and ultimately, we got rid of this case um, uh, via a motion for summary judgment, a very extensive and interesting one. Fortunately, RICO law has been fleshed out, but at the time, you know, there wasn't as much RICO law about things, and it was being applied to all kinds of bizarre things like this case. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, the, the ruling was affirmed by the Fifth Circuit, uh, but really annoyingly to me, the judge would not issue any sanctions for the outrageous and baseless accusations that were made. Um, meanwhile, things moved on. Uh, Mr. Williamson, uh, after 20 years, has now been indicted in Lafayette, Louisiana, in connection with a scheme whereby uh, it was alleged that the city attorney would refer to him DWI defendants to a diversionary project process that he ran, when in fact no such diversionary process occurred. I think there's going to be lots of things that are uncovered by Mr. Williamson. He is really a fascinating fraudster. We have followed him for 15 years now. <laughs> Mr. Mrs. Williamson is the lady right here. I don't know if you can see her to the um, right of the groomsman. Uh, she's no longer wheelchair bound. You can see her as the proud mother of the groom. <laughs> so uh, there are other cases that were like this. Um, I handled a, a securities fraud case involving a little company that was going to try to use banana peels, banana, banana leaf fiber and peels uh, to make some kind of oil spill absorbent. Uh, and um, the, there was a merger of two companies, and the lawyers, uh, and, and then apparently things weren't really going well with the company. It really was kind of going bust. Uh, the, one of the partners to the merged company sued the other attorneys claiming securities fraud. Um, and this is one of the things that's so amazing about this is the venom that, with, that goes with this. Uh, the law firm representing her, which helped itself out to be a securities fraud firm, did not plead an essential element of a 10b-5 claim, which is scienter. Um, so we filed a motion for summary judgment on that. And also, um, the, the plaintiff uh, had filed a 12.2 12, uh, 12 securities fraud claim and had not, um, but in her testimony, in her deposition, had not relied on any of the representation. She was very clear about that that were made. So really, there was a, a really easy motion for summary judgment, which we filed. We waited, of course, until it was too late for them to amend uh, their complaint and add in the scienter requirement. Uh, but uh, the judge was really busy with a big criminal trial, and so she just didn't rule on that motion, and we had six months of horrible discovery. Um, and I have to say, tempers flared quite a bit. Uh, there are a couple of motions for sanctions uh, from some lawyer saying the F word. That would be me. Uh, <laughs> it's an unreported uh, decision. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it really had to do with the fact that we were going to drag a poor man whose wife was due to have a baby that day away from his, uh, his home in Atlanta where, where the deposition should have taken place because the lawyers were from Atlanta, uh, to New Orleans. And uh, anyway, there it was. That's my excuse. Um, nobody was sanctioned. <laughs> and, uh, but ultimately, we went on a motion for summary judgment. And you really have to wonder about the people who would bring such a claim uh, and then, you know, fail to do the, the most basic thing, the, the plead the essential elements of a claim or not realize that their, their, their client had to testify as to reliance, but they do these things. And thank God that that's how we want it. Um, the other claim is a claim that I have ongoing now. It's a very sad claim, in my opinion. Uh, it's a, a young lawyer who's a title attorney and in the post-Katrina days when uh, things were pretty much a mess, his office was destroyed, uh, his home was destroyed, he was handling... Uh, his closings on what we call the North Shore uh, of Lake Pontchartrain, uh, New Orleans being on the South Shore, uh, which are pretty much, I wouldn't say escaped unscathed Katrina, but you know, you could actually do things there, like have water and electricity. 
And uh, he didn't have his normal staff, they had all left. And he was not as careful as he should have been about handling certain things and, and following up and documenting stuff. So uh, essentially what happened is uh, he was directed by the person who was refinancing her house to deal with a certain person at the local uh, real, real estate financing company's office. He did. She, it, he was never able to obtain information about the mortgage, the last mortgage being uh, paid off. He contacted the, the company that he thought was the company over and over again, got no information. And then the lo person at the local real estate office told him that, in fact, the loan had been paid off with Hurricane Katrina funds. Well, this is actually fairly common. Uh, the, in, the, uh, they would require that, and then you would have to then take a loan out to do your repairs on it. So he bought into that. He didn't write a letter confirming it. I don't think it would have made any difference in this case. And it turned out that that person at the uh, local financing company was a crook, and in fact has since been uh, convicted of several things. Um, and she took all the money. But it also seems that the person that was refinancing the loan was part and partial of the scam, that she was trying to work with that lady to do what's called a short sale, whereby she paid off her prior mortgage um, with a, um, for, with, for less money than was actually owed. Uh, and the crook got outcrooked is what happened, we believe. Um, this has been a nightmare case uh, for my client. Um, they made complaints to his insurer, his, his um, real estate practice insurer, as opposed to his liability insurer. He is no longer, because they canceled his insurance, therefore he could no longer practice law in that area. Therefore, he ultimately went bankrupt. Um, he actually did this astonishing thing to me, which is he stepped up the plate when he found out what had happened, which was not for se several months, uh, and paid her back mortgages, the arrearages, um, brought her a lawyer to file suit against the mortgage company who had employed the crook, uh, continued to pay while they tried to investigate this, uh, and then she turned around and sued him. And um, he lost everything he ever owned, and he was quite well off. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, this is how nasty the whole thing got. They, they had, um, uh, I think maybe some of you have heard about this, we had a rogue U.S. attorney uh, down in New Orleans, several of them that were blogging about cases, uh, and one of them was blogging about this particular case. They made a point of having really nasty publicity about him. In the meantime, he'd enrolled in seminary. Um, and finally, he, they were so ugly about it and made it such a public issue that he'd had to withdraw from the seminary. This is the kind of horrible case that can happen. And you, you just wonder what is in their minds. And right now, we're at a point where we're in settlement negotiations. Uh, they've come down from the mediation where they refused to make even an offer to us. They had several defendants in the case everybody and their mother, uh, and we're now at the point where uh, they've come down, they said they might make a you know, demand for two million, one million, she has no damages, by the way. Um, they're now down to 265,000, we counter, we responded with a $20,000 offer. So you can get there, but it has been a torturous path for this um, young lawyer, rel relatively young lawyer, to me anyway, uh, and, and uh, it is, there are very, very difficult cases. The insurance companies are not happy about the fact that you can't get rid of them and they require so much work on them because the other side is crazy, in a word. Uh, but uh, these are very challenging, very interesting, and very painful cases. Uh, my heart bleeds for my attorneys when, they have to, when I see one of these coming down the, on, down the uh, track as this one is. So I don't know where my time is. Oop, nine seconds. Thank you very much. <laughs>